this whole issue of governance of Islam as this lecture series is called is really um, a trigger to look at the question of how Muslims in European spaces are currently addressed as a minority, as a problematic minority um, by states, state agents, but also by other agents of society. And so it's really um, a very timely issue, I think, because um, the, both academia and the public sphere is very often addressing Muslims as a problem. And academia is really also a part of that very often and really looks at Muslim minorities as a close kind of entity and really repeats some of the questions which are currently around in the public spheres, in the media, but also in academia, where the main, the central question is always, are Muslims about to integrate well? Are Muslims about to secularize? Are Islamic norms compatible with liberal secular norms? Um, are Muslim women emancipated or oppressed? So these are the kinds of questions that are very urgently around in the public sphere and very often both academia and the larger public sphere and civil society actors really take up these questions without really addressing the very framework and the hegemonic framework which um, presupposes the questions but enables the questions as well. <coughs> so um, I think that this lecture series is really about shifting the gaze and looking at the ways in which Muslims are governed and what kinds of questions are raised. And my part um, and project is really also related to that. Um, my talk tonight is based on a larger research project in which I look um, at, the, at what I would call with Michel Foucault, hoping that some of you have at least heard about him, um, um, and I would I would call um, the empirical study point from which I would from which I really start this project is the, the current incitement to discourse and the discursive explosion on the Muslim question. What I mean by that is really that there is a proliferation of problematization of the Muslim presence and the Muslim participation and Muslims as a problem. Not just since 9-11, but this has a longer history, but not after 9-11 and obviously after the current events that we are all now witnessing, this proliferation has, has increased but the, and, and there is an, is an explosion of discourse, but you can trace this explosion already far before 9-11 you know, the, the, and I think this is also part of the label that we should all um, do, not just to look at at the issue of the Muslim question in, in its contemporary configurations, but also to historicize and to look at the genealogies of the deeper structures of modern nation states and how they look at minority questions and how they produce minorities somehow as well. So this has a longer history and I think it's really important to trace this as well. <coughs> and of course, one could um, deal with this incitement to discourse and the, in, the explosion of the discourse on Muslims in Europe from very different angles. Um, my, my particular angle is a Foucauldian one in which I really look at the conditions in which certain positions are to be articulated, are able to be articulated, and in which certain positions are not being articulated, and why is it so? So the conditions of speech acts and practices, what, is, what, is, what can be said, thought, and done, and what cannot be said, thought, and done. So this is the very broad framework which interests me. <coughs> and and the, the other part of it is really, as I already indicated, and I think the lecture series really does that as well, is really to shift the gaze from Muslims as a problem, as an autonomous kind of isolated group, that is problematic to the broader societal, cultural, political and economic conditions which also shape this problem, right? So shifting the gaze means really to not just pose the Muslim question or before the Jewish question, but really to pose the European question. <coughs> and um, so I'm looking in, in, in more particular ways at political rationalities that are 
related to this proliferation of discourse and the political practices that go about. Because I think that it's not just um, speech acts floating around in the public sphere, but it's also very particular and materialized practices, political practices, which go with the discursive, discursification. So this is what I'm very interested in. What kinds of political practices has this discursification and proliferation of discourse on the Muslim question generated recently? And what, what is their historical anchorage? And um, the more particular question, more, even more particular question is what I also um, mentioned here is how gender and sexuality figure in this proliferation because I think I can already mention that most of the debates, the public controversies and also the political practices um, in which Muslims are addressed as a problem really concern deeply bodily practices and on a very more specific basis gender and sexuality questions. So I'm just mentioning here the ongoing and never-ending debates on the Islamic headscarf, on the so-called burqa, um, more recently, on the question of praying in public and state spaces, which is also a very deeply gendered question, and more recently, <coughs> the discussions on male circumcision, which have floated around in, in many European public spheres, in the German case more um, violently, I think, than in other cases. I, I don't know if you've heard about the male circumcision debate, which really was quite a, quite a violent um, debate recently. It's, it's, so this is also about gender sexuality questions. And I think we could go on um, and look at other things. So this is, this is my starting point, maybe. <clears throat> and I argue that this incitement to discourse has currently um, revealed techniques of intervention that largely operate beyond the law, so on a paralegal level, even if the law is involved as well. But it's not just about sanctioning or allowing legally, but it's very often about civic pedagogy, about ways of communicating, about dialogue. Dialogue is a very important issue, has become a very important, important issue. But it's also very often um, about more outspokenly disciplinary practices. If we just think about the legal interventions um, or the extensions even of the law um, concerning preventing laws preventing terrorism, but also some of the religious practices such as the Boka questions in many European public spheres. France is definitely the most um, salient case here. <coughs> so to make this point a little bit more explicit, I will um, move in a minute to, some, to two more concrete political practices so that you can understand what my take is about. Um, and, but I would, I would like to tell you something about my analytical focus. So since I think you heard already something about governance um, from Marcel Moussa, from my colleague, and I think his, his take is a slightly different one, although the practices that he looks at are mainly the, the same, but the way in which he analyzes it and the analytical take um, of his approach to government, governance is a different one. So I'm very inspired by Michel Foucault's analytics of power, and of course I cannot explain that in five minutes and you would need to have another lecture series on Foucault's analytics of power and even of um, Foucault's lectures on governmentality. <coughs> Let me just say a few words why I think it's important or why I think it is crucial and interesting to take that analytical focus. So briefly, um, it provides a very interesting tool because um, especially governmentality studies or his lectures on governmentality are mainly preoccupied with power within liberal orders and within liberal states. So this is really what, what it is all about. So it's not just power as hierarchy or power as repression, but it's, it's the question of how freedom is regulated and how liberal societies really have, I mean, proliferate forms of power, which are very horizontal and not hierarchical, to say it very briefly and bluntly. Um, so I think that 
It is interesting because since the governance of Muslims in Europe is deeply ingrained in liberal politics, it is interesting to look at what kinds of powers and forms of powers are prevalent in these practices that are, um, that are shaping Muslim subjects and um, how this is related to the liberal order. So I don't understand, and with Foucault we don't understand liberalism as opposed to power, but ingrained in power. So this is, this is the, the first very important step. Um, and I think that this, the broader question really that, that leads, uh, or that, that this kind of approach um, helps us to understand is how freedom is governed. In a, in a more general sense. So it's not just about the Muslim question, but I think that the main question, the central question that Foucault urges us to ask is really what, how freedom is governed, and not just governed, but regulated, and through this regulation also produced. And I think one, another author that is interesting for me, and for this question of the powers of freedom is, oh, you can't read that, I think, so this is a very bad slide, is um, Nicholas Rose who wrote this very Foucauldian-inspired book on the powers of freedom. So there he, he really elaborates much more closely on what I just really sketched out here very briefly. <coughs> so this take on the policies vis-a-vis -vis Islam in Europe is really a different one than, than many other approaches which look at the historically shaped relationships between church, state and the nation, or which look at post-war immigration policies, um, or which just look at immigration policies from a legal perspective. Um, I think that these, these approaches are also relevant, I'm not downgrading them, but I think that this, such an approach really is interesting because it allows us to understand how liberal <coughs> subjectivities are formed within liberal societies. So it's a really different take. So how is, how is the free subject produced through forms of governments? <clears throat> and the other part which I find interesting and very important for the question of Muslims and the proliferation of discourse, which, which Foucault yeah. invites us to, to, to look at, is the nexus of power um, and knowledge, obviously. So it, I think that the, the discursification of Muslims is very broadly and very deeply ingrained in certain epistemologies which need to be dismantled and looked at more carefully in order to understand why are certain questions constantly readdressed, also repeated by academia, and what kinds of knowledge productions are important for these processes of repeating and reification sometimes of epistemologies. <coughs> So through this idea on the lens of Foucault's idea of governmentality, my central aim in this book and in this talk tonight is really to look at how the process of increasingly taking account of Muslims in Europe has generated particular governmental practices and techniques which constitute first and foremost interventions into Muslim forms of life, of social life and religious practices and sensibilities and affects. Um, I turned it um, in, my, in my title, as you could see, the question of shaping the body, which is a very broad kind of idea, but this really means the techniques, how, is, how are the techniques of the body um, shaped by these interventions? How are affects really articulated and even shaped and formed? Um, and how are more broadly religious sensibilities and practices shaped and formed, both on a public and obviously also on a private level. And I want to dwell into two examples to make it a little bit more concrete and explicit. Um, so the first example which I look at are citizenship tests in Germany. Um, and the second one are more communicative, more embracing practices um, of dialogue, of state initial dialogue vis-à-vis uh, -vis Muslims. Um, and so before I go into details about these two practices, I would like to contextualize very briefly where these practices are situated in. <clears throat> Interestingly, they both um, started at the same year, in 2006. 
Um, and they are very often conceptualized as completely opposing practices. So citizenship tests are not the same as dialogue measures, obviously, and I take them to be part of the same kind of political structure, and I tell you why in a minute. <clears throat> so if we look at Germany, um, we can see that Germany has traditionally dealt with immigration since the post-war period um, in a kind of laissez-faire attitude. So that is the, the, the notion that has been coined by a lot of political theorists who looked, or political scientists, who looked at the way in which post-war immigration was dealt with, especially in terms of religious and cultural plurality and the regulations. So basically Germany was always, it has always been um, characterized as a laissez-faire kind of politics. And <clears throat> this, is, this needs to be de definitely questioned, but I think what is clear is that the Muslim question has not really been the central question, um, and the way in which, um, in which Germany dealt with cultural plurality can be really seen in, in such very folkloristic practices such as the so-called Day of the Fall. I don't know if you heard ever anything about that. So it was called really the Day of the Foreigner, where foreigners, foreigners as they were called and still are called, um, could expose certain folkloristic versions of their culture in public. And they were asked really to bring some food and to dance and to you. So basically the very folkloristic notion of multiculturalism. <coughs> so this is obviously over now. The Day of the Foreigner is called the Day of the Intercultural Encounters. This has shifted, but still I think the, the notion and the idea of exposure of your cultural pre preferences and your cultural particularities is still really the same. Um, still, one can say that this laissez-faire politics has really changed, um, especially um, since 2000, where the citizenship laws were reformed. I don't know if you know that the German citizenship law has traditionally been extremely exclusive based on the idea of descent and blood. So it's very difficult for second and third generation immigrants to become Germans or to get the German passport because the, the notion of Germanness and Germanhood and nationhood was really strongly based on the idea that you need to have German descent in a way. So people who were traveling and situated around the world were still Germans in their third and fourth and fifth generation, whereas immigrants moving to Germany still kept the, the notion of foreigners, right? Because of the laws. So in 2000 there was a reform. <clears throat> so that was something which was considered a major break breakthrough in terms of inclusion. Um, and also I think that um, the idea of, of managing, of dealing with, of taking into account cultural and religious plurality has really shifted in a, in a sense that it's, it's becoming the main preoccupation of immigration policy. So integration is now the key and buzzword that, is also, that has also arrived political and academic spheres in the German case. So the laissez-faire has moved um, to, this, to this idea that we now need to catch up with what we have not been doing for a long time. <coughs> so, um, we can now, we can now um, ask the question whether this newly in the cultural and religious plurality in Germany is really, for Muslims especially, good news. Um, and my, I mean, my answer would be, as you can guess from the question, well, let's consider how it is, how this, how this taking into account really takes shape. And I, I would rather be very skeptical that this is this is a good news. And I would like to, I would like to to now come to the a little bit more concrete and practical part of my talk, so that you can see what what my take is really about. <coughs> so I. I look at the so-called citizenship test. Um, I already indicated that 2000 there was a reform, which was a major breakthrough, as I already said, or considered as a major breakthrough. Um, and yet again, after this reform, there were 
um, politicians, political authorities especially, but also civil society actors were thinking about means to still somehow regulate who could become a German citizen and who would not be entitled to citizenship. And so that is where the idea of citizenship tests comes about. And this has, as you might guess, been really a topic since 9-11. Um, so there, the, this idea of making boundaries and creating boundaries and demarcating the boundaries, who is in the nation and who is not in the nation, is really um, a result of, of several other practices, security practices and so on. So we have um, several discussions on citizenship tests and the, the implementation of the citizenship test started um, in, in the federal departments. So as you might know, Germany is a very federal um, state, so it has several federal departments and some of the, the issues such as schooling and education are really in the domain and the sovereignty of the, of the federal state. So is and was especially the idea of um, regulating citizenship. So the, the state of Baden-Württemberg, I don't know, I, can, I didn't put it here. So the state of Baden-Württemberg created the first um, citizenship test. Um, okay, now. Now you get it. So in 2006, it created it and it implemented it from 2006 to 2011. And um, this was not just a knowledge based test, so where immigrants and becoming members were asked to address questions about German history, German. Um, political or uh, German laws and the German constitution or stuff like that, but it was really a clearly defined idea to test the inner attitudes of becoming German. So it was therefore called attitude test and vernacularly Muslim test. Why Muslim test? Because at the beginning it was really organized and centered <coughs> around Muslim or, or immigrants coming from the Islamic conference countries, so really just geared towards them. And that obviously, as you can imagine, caused a public outcry. It was considered illegal, unconstitutional, and discriminative. So then, after a while, um, they changed this, this, I mean, officially they changed it and didn't call it, obviously, didn't call it officially Muslim test, um, and said that every, any becoming citizen could be asked about his or her inner loyalty to the Constitution. Still, it is clear that it were mainly Muslims who were asked, and mainly those Muslims who were visibly Muslims and who were marked Muslims. I mean, like, um, publicly and, and yeah, visibly Muslims. <coughs> so this um, test um, is a test which contains yes please what do you, what do they call as a foreigner outside germany so me as a belgian wanting to go to one um, to put back i have to do such a test no because you're from the eu yeah, okay so the limit is the eu then the Schengen. yeah no that, i mean of course it's of course i mean yeah <laughs> Yeah, no, and I, I mean they try to to justify these kinds of measures and uh, by saying that obviously, I mean EU citizens can circulate around and can get other passports. I mean, that, as you know, so it's not it's it's really there are different rules within the EU. So you would not be considered neither an immigrant nor a foreigner, but you would be, you know, a European. Yeah. So part of the of the notion of Europe as an entity. Did you have a question as well? Yeah, the, the test isn't obligatory, so no. No, I, can't, I, tell, you, I tell you a bit more about it. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's actually very weird and interesting. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, before I tell you how this was conducted, I oh, know this is too, too early, well, okay, it doesn't matter. So it, it contains 30 questions, this test. And um, the civil servant who is about to, who was entitled to ask these questions, was really asked 
to see whether the candidate would be a suspicious candidate or not. Yeah? And you can ask me, obviously, how would he or she measure that? And that's part of the, of the problem, obviously. Um, and so, yeah, let's go skim through the questions. I mean, you can imagine that a lot of the questions concern questions of Islamic terrorism, or Islamism, as it was called at that time. Um, I think one third of the questions concern that. Um, another set of questions concern anti-Semitic attitudes of Muslims or of people who are interrogated. And you can see that it's basically um, really about Muslims. And I, th I mean, I, I counted it, and two thirds of the questions concern sexuality and gender issues. So you can have a set of questions <coughs> here, um, which is really just a selection, and it just mirrors what this test was about. So let me just read through it very quickly. What do you think about the statement that a woman has to obey her husband and that he can beat her if she disobeys? And then question number nine, seven. Do you think that it is suitable to enclose one's daughter at home in order to prevent her from breaking the rules of honor? Then question number 14. What do you think about the fact that parents force their children into marriage? Do you think that such marriages are compatible with human dignity? And then question number 15. In Germany, sports and swimming lessons are part of the normal school curri curriculum. Would you let your daughter participate in these? And if not, why not? Um, of course, I mean, there's no question about the problematic presuppositions of such questions, and I don't want to go into details about that. I mean, I can see it on your faces that you're kind of, you know, shocked. It's interesting that you haven't heard about it, because it's kind of a... It's not so, it wasn't really, you know, the proudness of Baden-Württemberg, as you can imagine, right? So it was really, it's, it, it was not even easy to find these questions, you know, on the, on the web and to interrogate the, the responsible politicians and ask them what is going on here and who is entitled to, to get these questions and who, is, who are the civil servants who should ask these questions and how they are trained. Are they trained at all and what is, what is the outcome and so on? So they were very hesitant in answering them. That's such questions. <coughs> so, what I find really striking and important to, to emphasize is that these presuppositions and stereotypes which are circulating around in the public sphere have now really become the basis and target of governmental practices and intervention, which really operate not just on a state level, but at an intersection between the state and non-state actors. This is really important to mention because this test was not just developed by state authorities, but even Muslim, Muslim actors were involved, right? I mean, the so-called secular liberal Muslims were really drafting some of the questions as well. So there's, a, there's really an alliance between several kinds of people that, that really intervene into, into the public, into the private lives of these people that are interrogated. <clears throat> so while this tells, or these, these questions tell us very little about the sociological reality according to which Muslim gender norms have become increasingly restrictive in Germany as it suggests, right? This tells us very little about that, um, even if the test presupposes this. But it tells us quite a lot about the efficiency of the production and the circulation of such stereotype knowledges about Muslim otherness. Uh, which has now really reached the level of state policies and encouraged political authorities to intervene into a domain which usually liberal politics consider to be the intimate and the private sphere. <clears throat> so moreover, one should actually look at the underlying presuppositions about the deviant or the potentially deviant Muslim subject in its functionality, I think, as a technique of unmarking through the marking of the other. So in this case, through the performance of ideals of liberal secular society, which has incorporated and embodied liberal secular gender norms and forms of emancipation and gender equality, um, which is just supposedly disturbed by non-liberal practices, which now need to be addressed and reshaped. <coughs> so in other words, I interpret such tests 
of this particular test, not just as a matter of examining the other, but also and foremost even of constituting <coughs> and performing the self. And I will come back um, to that point later. Um, but I, will, I think one of the question that you already addressed is really important. Who is entitled you know, to ask this question and, and to inspect suspicious, supposedly suspicious um, people? Um, because I think it's really, really important that this test was not necessarily, I mean, these, I mean, not everyone should take the test, right? So it was said to the civil servants, if you find someone suspicious, really um, looking, or if you think that he or she is not loyal to the Constitution, raise the questions and raise them like this, you know? So you can just select, you don't have to go through all the questions, you can just select. So this, is, this really presupposes a very weird idea of the civil servant who is supposedly a neutralized agent that is neutralized from all the kinds of questions that are here, that are raised here, and that is supposedly able um, to interrogate people that he or she deems suspicious. So this is, um, this is a, a point which I think is really important to mention, that the kind of authority and and responsibility that is attributed now to these officers who do not have to go under I mean, any extra training in terms of um, intercultural encounters or something. So these officers become examiners without being examining themselves. <coughs> and this is, I'm saying, I'm emphasizing this so much because I think this is really symptomatic for what I tried yeah, to, to tell you about the discursification of the Muslim problem because this is really what is going on, because it is really a process of examining the other and not examining the examiner, right? So it's not about, it's really about marking and unmarking. So that is, that is why I think it's, it's quite symptomatic for something broader. <clears throat> and this also reveals um, the ambivalent status, obviously, attributed to these officers whose authority is based on the assumption that they themselves have incorporated and embodied these normative principles which they now uh, should test vis-à-vis -vis Muslims. So the civil servant here is considered to represent and to literally serve the state and at the same time he's imagined as a neutral and object objective observer whose personal views and emotions and sensibilities are not part of the discussion. <clears throat> At the same time, these personal viewpoints and sensibilities form the basis on which he or she is entitled to ask and interrogate the people. So this is the ambivalent thing, because it's his or her subjective feelings, right, which are not part of the agenda, but this is how he should sense that, it's, that, that a candidate is suspicious. <clears throat> you tell me, I can write if, um, I mean, how much time I have. No, you have time for me. About 30 minutes, 35 minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm um, going to come back to this point. So the the Baden-Württemberg test is obviously a very kind of caricatural mm -hmm. practice, and still I think it's interesting because. Even scholars have not really looked at it because they thought it's so ridiculous and so discriminative and, and it's so marginal in a way that you don't really need to encounter it more thoroughly, but I think it's really worth looking at it because still it has been practiced until 2011 at least, so it's not just for some months or something. So, And it's in this, the whole story of the test is very interesting, how it came about. The, the people who were involved and so on. I'm not telling you much about that, but I think this is, this is an interesting um, case to look at. <coughs> so in this um, citizenship test, um, the practices of interrogating Muslims is obviously clearly a disciplining, um, has a disciplining touch. It interrogates Muslims deemed suspicious, so not confining to the liberal order, and it also potentially sanctions these suspicious Muslims by not attributing them with the citizenship. Um, if the office
officer considers them hostile to the constitutional order. So the aim is here in this practice not necessarily to cure uh, deviance, as in the next example that I will tell you in a minute, but to simply presuppose deviance from the liberal norm <clears throat> and then eventually to sanction it based on a normative model of the values inscribed to the constitutional order. This is also important because is this part of the German constitution? I mean, that's also you know, a very important question because these people are called to show their loyalty to the constitution. How can you show your loyalty to the constitution? That's already a very difficult question by obeying the laws. But is this kind of, you know, part of the questions that other Germans are raised or asked? I don't think so. so. <clears throat> so this is, there is a supposed core and essence of the constitutional order, which is a very problematic one. I mean, I don't have to say much about that. And this is created through such practices, and that's why I find it interesting to look at. So the second example... Sorry. The individual can negotiate or uh, neglect or contest this uh, test. Is it possible? That there, is there a possibility? <coughs> Yes. Contest? Yeah. Yeah, that is, that's a possibility, but I think it's uh, not very wise to contest it. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you have ever been to any of the um, of, of the administrative of the of the offices where you have to show all your documents and you know praise um, that you would would get you know whatever either the status of. Um, of um, permanent residency mm -hmm. or the citizenship. I mean, I don't know if you encountered that in Belgium. I, th I, I think it's really, it's, it's a very tough experience. Mm -hmm. And so it's not necessary, I think it's not very wise <laughs> to, mm -hmm. to contest it. And so basically, I mean, empirically, I don't know how it really, how it worked. And no one has really worked on it because, as I told you, um, these, um, these officers and the politicians, the political authority who were responsible for this test, did not tell anyone about it. I mean, I tried to interrogate them several times and they just had these very classical pre-formulated answers and they didn't want me to, mm -hmm. to tell anything. To be a measure of integration, of incorporation, of embracement of Muslims, and of institutionalization of Islam. So it's it's the good example, right? So and the other is the bad, obviously, as you can imagine. And um, so I'm looking at it as you can also imagine it in a slightly different way, in a slightly more critical way. Um, let me just try to open. Okay, so now you this, I mean, I would have loved to show you some, um, not just the slides, but also some of the films, because you can see when you, when you scroll through this um, website, you can see a lot of <coughs> nice um, pictures and also nice small films where you can see how, how wonderful the encounters between the state and Muslims are in our <coughs> So this, it, it would be really good, but it's all in German, so it would not be very... Um, interesting for you. So there is an English website as well, but it, it, it has different information. So but still, you can you can go and, and have a look at it once you're interested in that. <coughs> um, so um, just very quickly, the the Deutsche Islam Conference was installed in 2006, as I already said, and it was considered a measure of integrating Muslims into the German nation. And it was a measure of embracement and the German state started really to, to find a forum and to create a forum where Muslims and state actors could sit together and think about um, what could we do together in order to institutionalize Islam on a more substantial basis. So this laissez-faire, as I already told you, was really now over, so it's rather a kind of, you know, we give you the hand, you can come into our boat and we have a dialogue on eye level. So that was how it was um, portrayed. It's a very 
complicated structure that, so they have plenary discussions where which are partly public but partly also semi-public and not and hidden. Um, basically um, 15 representatives of various Muslim organizations but also individual Muslims encounter 15 members of the state in these plenary discussions and then we have um, working groups. Um, four working groups and they shifted throughout the time. <coughs> this, this, I mean, started in 2006 and it's still active and they're, according to the government, it, sometimes the working groups changed and so um, it's, it's, I, I will not go into details about that, you can all uh, look at, you can look that um, up once you look at it more carefully. Um, so what I find interesting is that in this particular practice, Muslims are not um, sanctions, like in the first case, um, but they are taken into the boat, they are still examined, and they are to be convinced, and with, especially with pedagogical means, that a particular interpretation of the liberal democratic order provides the adequate ground, ground for an agreement. And this becomes um, particularly, this is a, an interpretation as you can already see, obviously it's not presented like that in this, in these um, I think it's better to <laughs> because you have so many things there and I think I would, would open something which is which should not be open. <laughs> so you can see it's really cozy. I mean it's, you can see a very nice cozy nice cozy pictures of Muslims and state actors, how they interact with each other and how they dialogue and how nice they get along. And so this is how the whole event <coughs> is presented publicly. So the, the whole web page is really, yeah, here you can see the list of, of um, participants and the kinds of um, commissions that they spread around. Um, so it's, hmm? who are the Muslim participants? Several participants of uh, Muslim organizations, as I said, mm -hmm. but also individual Muslims. So to represent the wide majority of Muslims, that's the goal. So everyone wants to participate has to apply? No. <laughs> no, no, no. No one can apply. It's all selected by the state. So there's no, um, there's no applying or no kind of, you know, you can't just enter and say I want to participate. So the state agents decide who is, who is a representative Muslim and who is not. Which, and this is a very important question, because this is obviously very problematic, and not just the selection of people who are deemed Muslim and adequate representatives, but also the agenda has been set up from the beginning by the state. Did you uh, want you to ask? my question. <laughs> yeah, so there's, there's no uh, way in which you can write a petition with a problem that you'd like to address, um, you know, gain signatures and see if you can get into uh, the, the conference to, to you know, lay your, your, your problems on the table and say, can we talk about this? We've got some ideas maybe about how the state could work no. together with us better. That's unfortunately not the right form for that. Okay. You can still write um, petitions and you can write letters. If it's um, taken into account, it's, it's very doubtful, I think. Mm -hmm. right. The contrast with uh, last week is very big on that issue because Last week we had a speaker of uh, the situation in Belgium and one of the main topics was that the state could not interfere in the choosing of representatives of the religion mm -hmm. constitutionally. Mm -hmm. So that's why now a lot of question marks are raising because now the state in, in that case in Germany is appointing really the parties of who he is speaking to. No, but that's also a very important point. I, I just left all these details, but thank, thanks for asking these questions because obviously they, they are very important. I just, I mean, I already come up with the interpretation, but this is, it's not a forum where representatives are selected in order to become uh, representatives of religious minorities, to become funded, to get funding or to get institutionalized at all. So this is a forum where you have, um, encounters where you discuss and so the state is always and that is interesting because some of the Muslim representatives and especially those of organizations 
really requested, okay, if we have this kind of dialogue, then our aim would be really to be recognized as a religious community, and that means on the same footage as the churches, for example, or other established religious communities. And then the state authorities stepped back and said, this is not our business, because this is not, it's not, it's not us who decide, but it's the federal states who decide. So there you have again federalism. So this is mainly, that, that's why this kind of encounter was um, very often denounced and um, <clears throat> dismissed, I think, even as symbolic politics. But I think it's not symbolic politics at all, because I think for me it's really part of, of the shaping of the Muslim subject in a very clear way. Although it is in a very nicely done way, so it's all, all about harmony, peace and understanding. I mean, I'm exaggerating here, but it's really about that, but obviously it's about telling Muslims in a nice way that, you know, certain practices are problematic. And so that's why I think, I mean, for example, looking at the agenda, uh, let me come to that point. Um, <coughs> so in the working groups, for example, um, there were topics that were formulated beforehand, such as um, the need for Muslim girls to participate in mixed sports and swimming classes. Um, or the behavior, and I'm quoting here, the behavior of Muslim boys vis-à-vis -vis non Muslim girls, not vice versa, or something, and more broadly, the amelioration of the situation of the Muslim woman worldwide. So these kinds of things were on the agenda at the beginning, <clears throat> and reading also through the agenda of the working groups, the legitimation of the state actors for setting up these these agendas in a way, becomes clear that Islam and certain religious practices associated with Islam are the problem, and um, are the problem for equal um, liberty for all. Um, <clears throat> so in, there, there were some interesting things going on behind the screens, obviously. This, what I'm telling you now is not visible here, it's not said here, but I did interviews with some of the representatives both of the state but also of the Muslim communities <coughs> and I got some of this informal information how these uh, working groups then happened and what kinds of questions were raised to them and what, what really happened within these encounters. So this is this um, these agendas that I already told you were part of the of the interrogation but it was also some of the of the representatives in a second. Some of the representatives, especially of the suspicious Muslim organizations such as Mili um, or or um, the, the more Arabic-speaking um, EGD, Islamische Gemeinde Deutschlands, they were asked to delete certain passages in the Quran which might be suspicious in terms of gender roles in these encounters. Obviously, again, this is not here. You can't see it here, but this is, but this is what happened. In the, in the encounters. Um, my question was, was this never seen by Muslims in um, the forum as degrading? Because now they're, they're being invited to talk with the state and it, it, it does sort of sound like, okay, they sit down and they're being told more or less why their values and how they see life, why they shouldn't, why they should just abandon that because that's not how we do things in Germany. Was that was that never caused for conflict within within the forum? Yeah, that was. That was, I mean, partly because I really need to say that as as I already indicated for the citizenship test, there were some of the Muslim representatives um, that were considered secular, liberal, secular Muslims who modeled the agenda, who modeled the questions that I showed you for the citizenship test, and who also modeled the agenda. So in that sense, um, not all Muslims were uncomfortable. Some really thought that this was what was needed. Um, and I think it's, it's not by chance that these individual Muslims have been invited, because it's, these were the kind of representatives that should have, you know, kind of taught you know, the other Muslims that are not yet there and not yet ready for freedom to become ready for freedom. So basically that was the, the, the main goal, so that it's not the state actors that do that, but the Muslims themselves. So this, this kind of idea of um, yeah, kind of replacing the authority. 
means. So what becomes actually apparent in both of the examples is the request towards Muslims to adjust not just to the basic principles of the constitution, but also to an ethical grounding, an origin that is constructed, especially within the encounter of the constitution. So an origin that is associated with the principles and to confess their inner conviction <coughs> to these supposedly shared ethical grounds. <coughs> and this also, I think, reflects an important semantic shift in the political authorities' assessment of Muslims in Germany. So this shift is based on the assumption that Muslim identification with constitutional principles in the German society is not sufficient any longer of their, for their true engagement as German citizens. So the citizenship test that I showed you is exactly about that, and this dialogue initiative is also exactly about that, although it is practiced on a very different, in a different way. So behind the screens, um, we could call, we could see this, this kind of idea to, to, to engage more clearly and more outspokenly and more thoroughly with the German constitution and with the values inscribed into this constitution with this notion that has been modeled um, that is called constitution plus. So something beyond the constitution needs to be shared. So this, it, I don't think this resonates very clearly with the discourse on social cohesion which is around in other parts of Europe as well. So what is social cohesion and where does it come from? What are the ethical presuppositions of the, so, of the social cohesion that who decides when the social cohesion takes place and who, who is in and who is out and so on. So this is part of the whole, of a, of a more general trend, I think. <coughs> so in the second round, um, this interrogation and very interpolative approach was actually much more implicit and, this, and part of the problem was that some of the Muslim representatives really said, this doesn't work. I mean, we can't, I mean, we can't just be in the defensive position and just all the time justify that we are good Germans and that we want to become good Germans and, and, and to show that by, for example, you know, so now they would show it by saying to Swishali, right? So this is the kind of um, interrogation and interpolation that was asked to them and they said this doesn't work. So um, in the second round, the gender and sexuality questions were milded and still at the same time there was a a, a, a whole working group called um, Gender Equality, which was not the case in the first time. And um, let me see if I can. Oh, maybe you could. You're better with your computer. Uh, while I'm talking, I'm. Uh, so, oh, yeah, maybe the power and then we could see here. Yeah, could you try? Okay, so I, I, while I'm just trying to, to show you, in the, in the second round, really, uh, what happened is that you had more people with headscarves, you know, so there were, in the beginning, there was no woman with a headscarf involved in the Islam conference. In the second round, there were some covered women, and um, still, I think, the, the way in which they were interrogated is very similar to the first round, but it's milded in a way that they found, they tried to find a consensus, right, on, based on the constitution. And um, what happened is really that they very often circulate documents and brochures, they circulated around in educational institutions, um, and they, they call it living gender equality as a common value. So, unfortunately, it's not there. Yeah, it's coming up. So you can see, it's, I mean, the, the, what is interesting in this regard is also oh, not fun. Basically, what I wanted to show is these very um, polished brochures that um, show how nice the encounter was and how, how nice the consensus was found between Muslim interlocutors and the state. And so it's 
what you can find in these brochures is either really very narrow, but which you can find already in other, I mean, basically in the Constitution, it's really about the basic principles and basic rights, so it's not anything more. Or you can find um, brochures in which um, Muslim girls in schools are addressed and teachers are addressed how they should behave vis-a-vis -vis suspicious Muslims. So this is also part of this proliferation of knowledge production on the Muslim question, which the DIK really is very, the Deutsche Islam Conference is very um, important for, because it really commissioned a lot of, of studies on, the Muslim, on how Muslims in school and in other, in other parts of state um, institutions behave and what we could do with the suspicious Muslims. In a milder way, but still in the same kind of logic of the problem lies within the Muslim community, basically. It disappeared. You see, this happens with this um, web page very often because sometimes, especially when people like me write um, critical stuff, they just put it away. For example, this is what I told you about the mixed, um, the mixed, um, the, the necessity of Muslim women or Muslim girls to participate in mixed um, swimming classes. I really go for a conversation, for an encounter on eye level, and so they put it away. So you can't find it anymore. But you can find it still in the documents, which when you, when you go through it, in the form hands. <coughs> They're still willing to talk to you. Sir? They're still willing to talk to you. Um, not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> no, not necessarily. I would not be invited as an interlocutor, although there are scholars invited, but not scholars like me. <laughs> but it's okay. <laughs> um, okay, so. So both examples, um, to come slightly to the conclusion, I think both examples are based very strongly on the idea to develop methods of guidance, analysis, and examination, uh, which shall ensure knowledge of the inner truth of individuals, especially Muslims in that case, and their formations into liberal secular subjects. And therefore they can be considered as part and parcel, I think, of a broader civilizing project, aiming at shaping, forming, and transforming subjects potentially considered deficient and not normal into normalized subjects. Um, and what I just mentioned towards the end, this proliferation of knowledge on Muslims and reliable data as it is called, you know, what are Muslims doing? Are Muslims moderate? Are they fundamentalist in its categorization? This quantification, measuring of Muslims is really part of this process of finding out about the inner truth and by finding out, constituting and producing the truth right about them, but not about us, obviously. So this is what I'm really interested in, how this process of, of the body of the other, the marking of the body of the other functions as a process of unmarking the ones who examine. So this is, I think in that sense, really um, links these two, at first glance, very proposed practices together in a very common um, logic. <coughs> so, um, to come to the conclusion, um, I didn't say much about the secular, although it was in the title. Um, because at the end it's a little bit complicated. The secular, how, how does the secular figure, you know, in these um, processes of shaping the Muslim subject? Um, for me it's really deeply engraved in secular politics and I understand the secular liberal matrix here as something which is not a stable norm that doesn't shift or that just, you know, is there and doesn't really move or is uncontested, but rather as, as, a, as a kind of form, a matrix, which constitutes the kinds of questions that are asked, both in the public sphere, in the wider public sphere, and in the political practices. 
um, I just told you. And when I speak about the secular, I mean two things mainly. Um, the first one is a set of regulative practices which are very closely tied to the nation state institutions and settings and also the practices which guide the borders between what is the religious and what is the secular in the public, but also thereby obviously in the private sphere. <coughs> and which also form thereby, by, by separating between the right and the wrong and the adequate and the inadequate religious expressions that also shape citizens. And that is very closely tied to the modern nation state. Um, and so it's, it's really the nation, the modern nation state institutions which have the sovereignty to guide these practices and to divide between the religious and the, and the secular. So this is the one dimension of the secular. And the second one, which is also, I think, very important for the political practices I try to, to sketch out here, is this, a more tacit and very often unmarked set, set of affects and embodiments and practices which are um, part of secular societies in a more invisible and unmarked way in the, con in the social conventions of these secular, um, liberal secular societies. And they are very often tacit and implicit and very often unmarked and that's why they are so difficult to even look be looked at because they are ingrained and embodied in the, in the practices. And I think many of these practices which I showed you, although I didn't really underline that, but they are really part of these very unmarked secular conventions that are not necessarily made explicit, but that are embodied. <coughs> and, um, yeah, to conclude, dimensionality in the interrogation of Muslims as Muslims and only Muslims and them, you know, only their bodily expressions and their um, problems and practices. This is this um, process of interrogation is what I would call what I would call for further analysis. This is what is important in terms of governance of Islam, right? So this is really in interesting and important to dismantle. And this leads me to a piece um, written by Sarah Rucker, who, uh, who was here at a certain point, and Nadia Fale, who some of you might know, who's my colleague um, in the anthropology department, um, who wrote a piece on the hegemonic frames and the, and the questions um, that these hegemonic frames really enable and, and um, articulate and repeat all the time towards um, minority questions, and they do it um, especially in regard to the Bay debates, um, and they say they say that these questions and the central question is, as you might know, is the headscarf emancipatory or is it oppressive? So this is the kind of framework, the hegemonic frame, in which also we as scholars are mired, and then we can just navigate between the two kinds of oppositions instead of dismantling the hegemonic structures of such questions. And this, this is also the unease, I think, of a lot of, of us being part of the, of the proliferation of knowledge on Muslims, that we basically just can navigate between these two poles, but we cannot, or it's very hard to be heard when you dismantle, when you try to dismantle the hegemonic frames. <coughs> so it, it's, this, these frames scrutinize their um, agency or lack of agency, their gender roles, um, their sexualities, um, or their integration or lack of integration, um, but they don't interrogate the very frameworks which enable the kinds of directions that we look at. So my my take, as I mean, to summarize, is really, as I said at the beginning, to turn the focus onto the hegemonic frames which, which enable and frame these questions. And these practices are just two minor examples, but they are quite powerful in the end because they really shape 
<coughs> the subject in a very powerful way, or at least they are intended to shape it. It's not clear what comes out. So the effects are very open still. Okay, thanks for the for your attention. I know that it was not too long and that you um, have still a lot of comments and questions that we can have a um, yeah, further conversation.